to the Word of God. If you'll turn your attention to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Thank those of you that were able to go out on yesterday and heard the report that several got saved. So we're appreciative of when souls get saved. Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> All right, I just ask you to sit, but I'm going to ask you to stand again, my goodness. We're going to read a familiar passage of scripture that we all heard, at least preached here before, but hopefully we can share a little more insight, um, beginning at verse number um, nine. I'll read 9, you read 10, and then we'll read 11 together. 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Together. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for the word of God. We ask that you'll bless the people of God and minister your grace and your peace unto us this, at this hour in Jesus' name. For the ones that are being challenged, oh God, I ask for the grace of God to minister to the hearts even now. Oh God, give us the overcoming strength that we need by the soothing grace that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We honor you and we thank you. We bless you because you're good and because your mercy endure forever. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise God. All right. Uh, as I said, we've gone this way before, this passage of scripture here, Paul's prayer. This is basically what we want to talk a little bit about. Paul's prayer. God is my record, he said, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. There was a longing deep in Paul's heart for the saints. And um, that's, that longing is a, always a true longing for those that really have a desire to see God's people free. And um, having a joy of Christ and uh, to mature in God. So this was Paul's desire that he, uh, for the church at Philippi. And uh, this was one of those churches that was uh, just dear to his heart. And uh, he loved all the churches, but this was one of those churches that was dear to his heart. Uh, there was a Philippian uh, jailer that was converted, a little slave girl by the uh, seaside there. A group of women there had gotten together and um, and began to pray. They had a prayer group. And so Paul and um, Timothy and I think Luke, they joined them. And out of that, some wonderful things took place. And so, um, and then uh, Lydia also. So it started with Lydia, the seller of purple, and then there was uh, the slave girl, and then there's the Philippian jailer. So that started the nucleus of this work here. And of course, add-ons came as time went on. So, um, as I said, uh, he didn't have any negative things really to say. Uh, some scholars talk about how much the strife, but it doesn't really emphasize the uh, a lot of strife as much as something that was brewing that Paul wanted to keep it from spreading. And so a part of his prayer as the introduction came, he said, for God is my record how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. And so that love here, studies say it's a sober kind of love that places high value on a person and actively seeks that person's benefit. Again, that love he was talking about, it's a sober kind of love that places high value on a person 
and actively seeks that person's benefit. And so this is what Paul prays may abound more and more, that kind of love that seeks, that places a high value on a person. You know how we sometimes, we, we may not place a lot of value on people as we should. Sometimes we can be guilty of that. And, but Paul was saying that I pray that your love will, in, will increase more and more. And then he said, verse 9, in all, I'm sorry, in, yeah, verse 9, in knowledge and in all judgment, all insight, all moral insight. Uh, and, and so some say in all discernment. And so that love that we have, God wants it. In other words, he was not saying that the Philippians did not have love, but he was basically saying that he wanted their love to grow more and more in a mature fashion so that that love uh, would be able to uh, abound in insight, moral insight and in, uh, in, in the knowledge of God and the knowledge of his will. So uh, it's kind of like in wisdom, growing more in wisdom. And um, so that, and then verse 10 says that you may abound, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you might make, in other words, wise choices. And then that you may be sincere and without offense, without being offended and without offending till the day of Jesus Christ. Then verse 11 says being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So once again now, verse 9, part of this prayer, he wanted their love to grow, to grow more and more in their relationship with Jesus Christ, growing more and more. And you see, the more we grow in God, the more we bear fruit. Isn't that right? And because fruits come by Jesus Christ. So uh, this is his plea in prayer that after he heard of the good things and making requests for them with joy and for their fellowship in the gospel, being confident of this very thing that he that has begun the good work in you will continue to perform it till the day of Christ. And uh, so there he was in jail. There he was in, in, in uh, uh, incarcerated. And he had this joy. He had this uh, love for the saints. And uh, so now he's thinking in terms of them, um, as, as you see in chapter two, he unfolds it a little more, talks about uh, being unselfish or talking about um, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then he goes and gives the example of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And then he gives some other examples. He gives some admonitions. But then he um, shares about uh, Timothy, uh, who he says... Uh, Verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy, he shortened it to you, that I also may be, be, be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But then he said, but you know the proof of him that as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send to you presently so soon as I shall see how to go with me. And then he goes and talks about Epaphroditus, a brother and companion in labor and messenger, he said, that ministered to my wants. He longed after you all, was full of heaviness because you heard that he had been sick. Indeed, he was sick near death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And then, uh, so he gives this example of Timothy, he gives this example of Epaphroditus, and he gives... Uh, the example of Christ modeling that humility. And um, so he prays for the church at Philippi that their love may grow, just begin to increase more and more. And the more the love grows, the more grace rests upon that person. Isn't that right? And so this is what he's praying here for them 
Uh, so it's a love, again, a sober kind of love that places high value on a person and actively seeks that person's benefit. And um, the rest of the prayer emphasizes love not as affection but as behavior. Behavior that is both pure, stemming from right motives, and blameless, lacking offense, that is. So, um, and also the knowledge, growing, grow, growing more and more in knowledge, he says, uh, this knowledge is an ever-increasing knowledge, knowledge of God and of his will, and moral insight, or depth of insight. So, uh, humility, unselfishness, obedience, those terms are synonymous with chapter 2. And um, humbleness of mind or wisdom, knowledge, full or innate, knowing or knowing that comes from experience or personal relationship. In knowledge, growing in knowledge and in judgment, which is moral understanding based on experience. So now he says he wants our love to grow more and more experientially. And uh, so this is what God calls for us. So there's a growing indeed that God wants us to, to begin to grow. We, we, uh, we are excited about the things of God. We do things, but there's a, a growth that has an insight into human frailty, into human uh, woundedness and hurtness. And so that love, as we, the more we grow in insight and, 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 and experience, there's a grace that rests upon us. And that grace enables us to walk softly and in great humility. And then he says um, that... Um, sorry, Philippians. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may make wise choices, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit had me to, to sort of zero in on fruits. Um, and so I want us to look in the word of, a little bit about fruits. Okay, so now go with me to John 15. Turn your Bibles if we are to the book of John, chapter 15. If you're there, say amen. John 15, verses, the first eight verses, this is what it says. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. I want to see the emphasis on fruit. Somebody say fruit. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean, he's talking to his disciples. Through the words which I've spoken to you, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth, what? Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So here we see a relationship. We see a relationship of oneness or a union with Christ. This is key in bearing fruit. And then he says, um, verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done to you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So see the emphasis here on abiding in him in order to bring forth fruit. 
And this is for all of us, when we, the more we abide in God, that is in our relationship with God and our fellowship with God, the more uh, the fruits of righteousness are going to come. The fruits of love and joy, peace and long suffering and patience and meekness. All of that is going to flow out of our relationships or by the spirit of God unto you and I. So the emphasis here now is fruit. I want, I want to, uh, um, just us to follow the importance of that God places on fruit. Bearing fruit is a process. So I might say process. And our ability to bear fruit increases as we mature. Abiding in Jesus and Jesus abiding in us is the key to reaching that goal. Read it again. Bearing fruit is a process. No one need to be discouraged if you're not bearing fruit. Just give heed and begin to give heed to the word and be, continue to grow in God. And the fruits are going to come. It's like, you know, you, you think, take a tree. You said uh, people set out shrubs and trees and they give the tree time to grow. And they know that it's not going to bear fruit until it grows, right? And because fruits, the timing of fruit is after that tree grows gets to a certain level of maturity. And so in, in, uh, he likened us to trees. And so bearing fruit is a process. And it takes time. And uh, our uh, ability to bear fruit increases as we mature, as we ripen. And we'll talk a bit more about it afterward. Um, so abiding in Jesus is key to that. He says, well, apart from me, you can do nothing. Then love is another. So he mentions love, verse number uh, nine in John 15. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. So then he says, if you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. Even as I've kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. And uh, so here, first he talks about the fruit. Then he comes on and talks about the love. So love is, 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 is that command that we all heard him speak in John 15, 13. It's another of this command, the key command, and the type of love Jesus is commanding is like this. He said, like the Father loved me, this is Jesus, and then he said, so have I loved you, right? And now he's saying, telling them that that's how I want you to love. As the Father loved me, and as I love my disciples, I want you now to love in the same way. Right? So out of a relationship with Jesus, it will enable us to have that agape kind of love, that unselfish love, that love with right motives, right? It comes from Jesus Christ because Jesus is pure. And uh, so this is what he was sharing about the love here. And um, and so this love is not marred by selfish ambitions and or ill will of any kind. Selfish ambition is to be replaced by self-sacrifice and service. Love. All right, now I want you to turn with me to Psalms chapter 1. We're looking at the emphasis that he places on fruit. Psalm chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1, look at the first three verses there. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his what? His fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. 
So we still want you to emphasize, I want you to look at the emphasis that the word places on fruit. Once again, someone say fruit. All right, now Matthew chapter 7, I know I got you going flipping a little bit, but I just want you to follow with me uh, um, the emphasis on fruit. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15, when he was talking about being aware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but in they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by what? By their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot, thank God, bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth Good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their what? Fruit you shall know them. So saints of God, what is the Lord emphasizing? He's emphasizing our lives, our behavior, how things, how we live our everyday lives, and not only before God, but before one another. So he's saying bearing fruit is essential. This is this is how. Uh, we separate the false prophets from the prophets, from the true prophets. The, the false prophets cannot bear fruit. Why? Because they're not born of God, right? Everybody that is born of God can and will bear fruit because we're born of God and fruits come by the spirit of God. So, um, but my, again, my emphasis, I, I want you to see the emphasis on fruit bearing that the Bible points out here. So the tree is known by its fruit, amen? And uh, the keep, let's keep that in mind so as we grow and we continue to grow, because we're growing, but as we continue to grow, Paul's emphasis that their love may just overflow more and more in knowledge and in insight or judgment that we may make wise choices so that we'll be sincere without offense, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. All right, now we're going on to Psalm 119. No, I'm sorry, Matthew 13. Um, Matthew 13, beginning at verse 18. This is a parable here he spoke. Hear ye therefore the parable of the soul. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that hear the word and anon with joy receives it. Yet hath he not, not root in himself, but dure it for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. He also that receiveth seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches does what? Choke the word and the person becomes what? Unfruitful. So we have to watch out for the cares of this world and the deceitfulness that riches are sometimes if a person has wrong motives in their heart, they, they are about wealth or, or riches and uh, it'll tell on them in time, right? And uh, if somebody is weighted down with the cares of this world, uh, uh, then that will also choke the fruit. It'll choke the word so that the word is not able to bear fruit. The emphasis is on the bearing the fruit. Everybody with me? So it's very important that uh, what the Lord is speaking to us at this time about the importance of bearing fruit. When we bear fruit, 
uh, uh, households will be saved. When we bear fruit, people on our jobs will be saved. When we bear fruit, people in the marketplace or people that we, wherever we have relationships, because people are always watching us, right? And he didn't say by our, uh, our testimony, he said, but by our fruit. It's very important, y'all. God, it's like God is saying that, uh, that that fruit that we bear is the thing that causes people to know what kind of trees we are, whether we're trees of righteousness or trees of unrighteousness. That's the key there. And uh, I, as I've, I've shared so many times before, when we grew up on the farm, I could tell a peach tree. Well, I got, I, I was able to pay. Tell, tell those trees by their leaves, but that's not what the Bible said here. <laughs> I got to know a grapevine when I saw the leaves. I got to know a pear tree because I, I got to know the leaf. But, you know, if a person's coming along and don't know the leaf, they can't tell what kind of fruit they are, right? But the key is, uh, if you can miss it, if you look, this is, okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's an apple tree. It looks like an apple tree, so the tree leaves look like an apple tree. Well, the, the truth will be told once that fruit comes forth, right? Because it's not going to be a pear if it's an apple tree. It's not going to be an apple if it's a pear tree, right? So this is the whole point, and our lives are like that. He calls us trees. All right, let me go on here. The emphasis is still on fruit. Okay, how far did I read? Let me see. Did I read all? Okay. Verse 23. Okay, so now look at uh, verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hear the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and bring forth some in hundredfold, some 60, some 30. So God wants us to bear a lot of fruit, just fruit in abundance. So if we start to love and we pat ourselves on the back because we've done a good deed to somebody, and yet we get offended that somebody says or does the wrong thing, then, you know, that's, that's not really. Bearing fruit, he's talking of consistency, right? Yeah. So as we, the more we grow in God, and the emphasis is we are growing, but the more we grow, the more we'll be able to bear fruit. Now, since Jesus said we cannot bear fruit of ourselves, it really depends on, y'all get this, a relationship with the fruit bearer. Make sense? All right. So uh, it's an intimate relationship with God. Sometimes a person may have a shallow relationship with God and they don't really bear fruit. But if a person has a closer, more intimate relationship with God, they begin to bear fruit because the fruits of patience, the fruits of forbearance, the fruits of forgiveness began to come out. Why? Because they, they are tight with Jesus. Are y'all hearing me? When, when that person is tight with Jesus, they're fellowshipping and Jesus is constantly their communion. And so they said, no, this is, no, no, this is not good. And so they either make it right or they do what the Lord is saying or God may whisper and say do so and so because they have that, 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 that relationship with, with Jesus Christ. So that's the key to bearing fruit. We can't do it of ourselves. All right. Um, now Luke 8. Luke 8. Okay, I want to emphasize verse 15 where he's, it's the same, talking about the same parable. But what he does and bear it, bring forth fruit with patience. That's what I want to point out. He adds that. So bearing fruit is a process. Somebody say process. So if you are not bearing fruit, if you're saved, and you, you love Jesus, you keep on tightening up your relationship with God and continue to grow, and you're going to bear the fruits of righteousness because 
you have you are in union with Jesus Christ. Very important, y'all. And uh, this is what the world needs so desperately to see a life fruit. Psalm 11911 says, Thy word, and, and, and Jesus says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, but how many know that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus is the word. So now he says, uh, Psalm 119 says, uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So that's one of the keys here, growing in the word of God and understanding, staying in the word or having that fellowship in the word. All right, now I'm going to go on further. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to, he said, emphasize and find, get the scriptures and do some sharing and teaching on the fruit bearing. So that's what I'm doing. Luke 13. Verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon, found none. Then said he to the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumber it the ground? And he answered and said to him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, you shall cut it down. Now, so Jesus is teaching now. He's, uh, 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 he's teaching them about the importance of fruit bearing. So here he has us here. We're not on TV today. We may have, we are on camera, of course. <laughs> but he's talking to us about bearing fruit. We are bearing fruit. If we are bearing fruit, the Lord said he will prune us. Look at somebody say, oh, Lord. He will prune us so that we can bring forth more fruit. Somebody said, well, why is not God satisfied when we're bearing some fruit? God knows what he's capable of doing in our lives. He knows the abundance. It's like a good, uh, a good vine dress, a good harvester. You know, a person, a, a farmer, if he has fruit trees, then he wants the maximum production out of that tree, right? So he takes good care of it. He prunes it, cut off the dead leaves and everything. He sprays it for worms and everything of this nature, fertilizes if necessary. All of this so that that tree can bear fruit, right? And more fruit. So God does us the same way. Simple, I know, but I want to make it as plain. But this is, uh, this is what God has wild. Now, it's an individual thing, right? Everybody before the Lord can develop and should develop a relationship before God so that we will begin to bear more fruit. That's God's goal for all of our lives. And, um, okay. There's six where I read six. All right, I read the whole parable there. Okay. Uh, John chapter 12, moving right along. John 12, 23. I think I got it right here, yeah. Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say to you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and do what? Die. It abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. So we see now in addition to what Jesus is saying in John 15. We see, and this is he was talking about his life. And, uh, but he said, he that love his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If a man serve me, let him follow me and where I am there 
shall also my servant be if any man serve me let him or him with my father honor so the the scribes and Pharisees they didn't understand uh, that Jesus is glorification would come through death. His glorification would come through death. They thought he was just, the Messiah was just going to have a kingdom here and then they were going to enjoy that kingdom like Solomon's kingdom. But that is in the years to come, in the consummation of the millennium. But down here when Jesus came, that's why they couldn't relate to him as a little servant down here on earth. It didn't seem to add up to what they had thought they thought in mind. But uh, the point he's making is Jesus' glorification would come, but it would come through his death. So he says, except a great grain of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. A grain of wheat, no matter how healthy the grain is, its glory lies in its death. For only as it dies will it produce a new plant with many seeds. We would not be here enjoying Jesus Christ if somebody hadn't died. Jesus died. It's okay. It's real quiet in here. It's okay. It's okay. I understand. But listen to what the Lord is saying to us. Except a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. Yes, he was talking about his glorification. But it's, 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 it can be applied to us. If Christ does not die, did not die, there would be no Christ-like people. Death to self. Galatians 5.22 says, and I'm bringing that part to a conclusion. Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law and they that are Christ have crucified or put to death the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Death to self. Somebody say death to self. So the spirit in us bears fruit. Hebrew 12. This is one of the last one on fruit bearing. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? Then in verse 11 says, now no chastening for the present seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. You see the emphasis on fruit? Unto them which are exercised thereby. So God, in this process, we may be going through, we may be challenged, but never fear. God is after the fruit. 
Now, and in, 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 in uh, going back to the text now, what he mentions here in um, Philippians, he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. And Ephesians chapter 3 mentions something when he was talking about the love. Paul had another prayer. He says, verse 14, 314, for this, um, yeah, for this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Remember that parable, the part of the parable where he said, uh, having no root in himself. And uh, so when the sun came, that plant was withered. Remember I just read that? So now he's saying, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints, to grasp with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. And to know the love of Christ, that's experiential as well, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. All right, we're bringing this to conclusion here. Practical, practical. Philippians 3, Paul was really talking to them. He started out saying, rejoice in the Lord. Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then he was talking about his experience uh, as a Pharisee. He was a strict doer. And supposedly he had a lot going for him. But then when he met Christ, um, uh, he, God made him see that his righteousness really was not acceptable. And once he understood that, he began to pursue God. And he says, uh, 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 let me just read that before I give these few practicals. Um, This was a, several days ago I had, it was given to me, but he says, verse four, though I might also have confidence in the flesh if any other man think that he had wherever he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, it's touching the law, Pharisee, strict doer. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellence see, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done rubbish, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the partnership or fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I'm also, I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things. Somebody say, forgetting those things, things. which are behind. And reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So there is a pressing forth. Forgetting the things uh, that were behind and uh, pressing forth to new things, right? Pressing forth. And um, so in conclusion, uh, fruit bearing, growing, continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ because God is the producer of fruit so that we uh, can Actually, the ultimate goal here is to bring glory to God and so also to be like him. So when he comes, there will be no shame. Why will there not be any shame? Because as he is, so are we.
in this world, we look like him. We look like him in our character. So when he shows up, we ain't got to run and hide and duck for the light is too bright. But we are like him. His love has been perfected in us. And all through the trials, through the suffering, the tribulations and the persecutions. And so God is at the fruit. So if uh, uh, um, and this is what he concluded, uh, concludingly was saying when I tied the two things in Philippians together. He said a lot of things, but just tying that together. Uh, he said attitude first, attitude first. Stay in the realm of faith. Not fear, not anger, not frustration, no guilt. But faith. Stay in the realm of faith. Then um, Paul said, I know how to abound. I know how to be obeyed. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. That attitude of faith. Things can happen to us, against us, and we can feel aggravated, frustrated. But stay in the realm of faith. Isn't that right? Seven days a week, if we stay in that realm of faith, then we're going to be okay. Attitude first. That's the one more. Number two, the hindrance of God's miracles is, is, is sometimes his wrong attitude. Let's not agree with Satan against our lives, our loved ones. Agree with God by thinking, faith, and speaking. Watch out for deceiving spirits. Number two was Sometimes the hindrance of God's miracles is wrong attitudes. Number three, control the tongue by monitoring the thought life. Control the tongue by monitoring the thought life. Number four, get to know God, grow in knowledge. And number five, don't even fear Satan. He is only steers us in direction for us to learn more of God. God is for us. Our refuge and strength. Many we affliction, suffering afflictions. I know that many of God's people are suffering affliction. But remember this: if you keep the goal in mind, God is after fruit bearing. That's what He wants out of our lives individually and collectively. Somebody says this doesn't make no sense. Why am I doing going through this? But don't worry about it. Remember, it's fruit bearing. God. Is causing us to bear fruit by the Spirit. And we keep that fellowship and that relationship with Jesus Christ tight. Forgiven when we need to forgive and, and speaking the truth in love. Then we're going to bear those fruits because God is in us. And he's in us to will and to do of his good pleasures. God is working in us. Paul said it is because it is God that is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Somebody's suffering right now. Somebody's agitated. Somebody's frustrated. But remember this. You're going to get through it. You're going to get through it. Because God is for you. And God is with you. So Father in Jesus name I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you're faithful in all of your ways. We honor you, Lord. I ask that you'll make us solid, stable, firm, committed. Oh, God, unwavering in our faith. And one wavering, Lord God, that will be stalwarts in the faith. That will be pillars, oh God, and trees of righteousness. Not moved by things that we see. Not moved by circumstances and situations, but, oh, God, anchored in your love, anchored in our roots just growing deeper and deeper in God. Thank you, Father. You are dependable. You are reliable. You are trustworthy. And as we continue in our relationship with you, we get to know more about you. Your faithfulness and your motives are all pure. I thank you, God, and I give your name to glory. I give your name to honor. Sin now, prosperity upon our souls. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Send prosperity. Remove, O oh God, the wicked hand of Satan, God, that comes to oppress and condemn. In the name of Jesus Christ, renew our strength. Restore the joy by your divine power. Send the help from your sanctuary. In the name of Jesus, if you're near somebody, just join hands with them. I thank you, I thank you for destroying his dominion. For he is a liar and the father of every lie. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for you are the truth indeed. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray for these, those that are suffering, oh God, and need the grace of God. I pray for them now, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that you'll release your divine grace and love upon each one by your power and by your grace. Oh God, hallelujah. Oh God, by your spirit. For oh, we fight the same enemy. I thank you, Lord. Make us one. Unify us even more. Oh God, that we may stand as one man. United in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory be to God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord God. Push back the powers of evil, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless you and we praise you.